Today's episode of Socially Democratic is now available on Patreon. Join our Socially Democratic community for free or for as little as $2.50 a month and you can help support the show. And when you sign up as a campaign organiser, you get access to our premium episodes, free ticket to a live show and access to our haters gonna hate the rest vote Labor merch. And we'd like to thank our latest uh, Patreon members, Cameron, Jason, Basil and Reed. Comrades, thank you very much. And to join, please follow the links in our bio. Today's episode is also brought to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a campaign agency that specialises in community organising. We only work with people who want to build power to make the world a better place. Uh, we develop community engagement strategies to win campaigns both big and small and we train engagement staff and volunteers in the Marshall Gantz framework of leadership, organising and action. If you want to create change in your community, then hit us up at dunstreet.com.au. Today's episode is also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Morris Blackburn believe the law should serve everyone and not just those who can afford it. Morris Blackburn has been fighting for workers' rights in Australia for more than 100 years and have helped more than half a million people get the compensation they deserve. And if you've been injured at work or on the road, you may have a claim through your super. So for expert and empathetic legal support, call Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast. It's out every Friday that dives into the campaigns of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And it is the end of the month, so therefore it is time for the Feeny Files. We'll be talking to David today about all the things that's happened in federal politics uh, uh, over the last month. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the show on uh, wherever you get your podcast uh, and be sure to give us five-star reviews on Apple Podcast and um, support the show by joining the Socially Democratic Patreon uh, um, community. And for everything else, follow us on Dunn Street at YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. All right, let's get to today's episode. We are taping this one on a Wednesday morning on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. Uh, I'm speaking slightly with a hushed tone. It's 6.30 in the morning. I don't want to wake up our neighbours. Um, but uh, before we begin today's episode with our regular monthly guests, uh, a few words on the Melbourne City Council elections that are taking place this October and apologies to both our interstate and international listeners. And full disclosure, uh, I am conflicted on this because I am working on the Nick Rees for Mayor uh, campaign. And before I begin, I'm going to read you a quote from the newspaper. Rees, a former Labor State Secretary, lost his bid to secure Labor preferences uh, during the ballot negotiations, and they went instead to a Liberal candidate, Aaron Wood. That's the end of the quote. Now, Wood isn't an official Liberal ticket, just as Reese isn't on the official Labor ticket. In fact, Phil Reid is running as the Labor candidate for mayor. And what I've been told, um, made a call way back to Aaron Wood uh, for Lord Mayor of Melbourne, a man who has made one of his central policy platforms to uh, stand up and have a crack at the state Labor government. Now, I'm not sure what uh, Phil's personal beef is that brought him to uh, want to have his campaign do this in preference would ahead of Nick Reese, who was a member of the Labor Party. But perhaps um, I would know if the Labor ticket had bothered answering our calls over the weekend in terms of these preference negotiations. Uh, Phil not only cut out his cut out a card carrying Labor member that is Nick Reese, he then took uh, a pot shot. Uh, at the personal, and there was reported in the paper on Monday, Mr. Reid, Phil Reid said, in terms of policy and personnel, the Nick Reese ticket cannot make any claims to be a progressive ticket or consistent with the views and the values of the Labor Party. Now, that's a little bit disappointing because there are many, many talented, respected, progressive Labor Party people who are working on the Nick Reese for Melbourne mayor campaign, people who have spent years and years electing successive Labor governments, Labor governments that have made Victoria the most progressive state in our federation. And to say that those people that are working on this campaign uh, do not hold up to the Labor values 
is very, very disappointing. And I would put their record against the lobbyist in Phil Reed any day of the week. Now, I would never suggest that Labor members who are listening to this podcast that are eligible to vote in the Melbourne City Council elections break their pledge and vote against Labor. In fact, Social Democratic recommends Labor members in the City of Melbourne to vote for the Labor ticket. That is our endorsement. However, what you can do is you can give a fellow Labor member, a person that has worked for the BRAC government, the Brumby government, the only uh, woman Prime Minister this nation's ever had, works for Julia Gillard, you can give that person, the person who's dedicated their life to the Labor Party, the Labor movement, you can give them uh, your number two vote, and I encourage you to do so. Anyway, enough about local government. David Fanny, welcome back to Socially Democratic. Thank you very much. And uh, it's good to be talking about a Melbourne City Council election because while you've apologised to your interstate and international listeners, it's important that they understand that as Melbourne's cultural is the cultural and intellectual capital of our nation, the mayoralty counts, right? <laughs> it does. And uh, it's obviously going to be quite a fight. I, I, I mean, I think from the great distance I am at presently here in sunny Portugal, um, Nick is suffering from being the front runner and uh, a whole lot of people who uh, might imagine themselves as winners are trying to form coalitions against the guy who they think um, is likely to win. The fact that that has fractured the solidarity of Labor members supporting each other in elections is a shame. Uh, it is, and I think that's the overwhelming sentiment within the campaign at the moment um, because, uh, you know, our expectations were that we thought we'd be able to support the intentions of... It's a weird election, the Melbourne Council election, because it's kind of like a... Um, there are two ballot papers. There's one for the council to elect the councillors, nine of them, and it's like a Senate-style ballot paper where you can vote above or below the line. Uh, and then the mayoralty is a direct election that looks like a how to vote for the House of Reps. Uh, like you number one through to 11. Um, and we just sort of thought that we could align our interests. Um, Labor's got some amb we, amb ambitions to get more people on the council. Um, and we've got well, you know what they say, if all else fails, read the rules. And um, uh, isn't it true to say that under the rules, the, the, the glorious Victorian branch of the Australian Labor Party, ALP members are obliged to preference one another? Yeah, but there's also a weird anomaly in our branch rules because there is a chop out for the Melbourne City Council that's been in place for a number of years that actually gives eligibility for people like Nickaroos to stand as essentially independents, uh, whereas anywhere else in the state, uh, you would have to get, um, you'd have to be in the okay. endorsed, endorsed Labor ticket. But Melbourne City Council is gerrymandered when Jeff Kennett set up the council many, many years ago. He gerrymandered it in a way that it favoured business. So if you own a business in the Melbourne City Council, you get two votes. If you own property in Melbourne, you get a vote, even if you don't live there. And obviously, if you live here, you get a vote. Um, and so in order to labour, you know, labour's best result out of Melbourne City Council mayoralty elections, 10%. 10% is not enough to win the mayoralty. Um, and in order to do so, you need to run on a centrist ticket. And that's what the Nick Reese ticket is. Um, it's a balanced ticket. It represents the diversity of the electorate, uh, and that's the ticket we constructed, and uh, and that's and that's half the reason why I work is with front runners. And we've just got a really fucking good campaign team working on it. <laughs> that's doing a really really good job. And so now, even though we've been locked out of these deals in which we wanted to try and work with our comrades in the Labor Party, we're just going to have to try and just run a good campaign and leave it all on the field and let the voters decide. Anyway, that's it. Believe. The old, <clears throat> do it the old-fashioned way and win the election. Yeah, exactly. And I can't believe we've spent this amount of time on Social Democratic talking about local government. There's the first. Well, why would okay, you talk stop talking about New York elections or you know, elections anywhere else when you can talk about Melbourne City Council elections? Well, I've set the bar now, haven't I? I need to do local government elections across the world. So. <laughs> yes. uh, let's talk about Australian politics. Uh, you are now overseas. I was in the United States for a large chunk of the month that was September. So um, we're going to have to try and catch each other up on what's been happening. The one that did happen while I was away was the 
Albanese government seeking initially to exclude the question around identification of folks who are identified as LGBTQ plus from the next census. Uh, when I first heard about it, my eyes rolled. I was like, why are we talking about this? We are six months out from an election campaign. Um, shouldn't we just be talking about the things that matter to voters that's going to get us over the line? Um, even what I got from uh, Peter Dutton, even he was like, why are we talking about this? Because when the question was put to him, instead of him jumping on this and saying, this is, uh, you know, the culture, the woke left gone mad or whatever, he said, I don't want to talk about this. I want to talk about the high cost of living and like, <laughs> labor's failures. Like even Dutton was going, is this a dead cat? Are they throwing a dead cat on the table to get me to stop talking about the things that I want to talk about? And even I was thinking, maybe they have done that deliberately just to try and switch up the conversation. David, what is your uh, reflections on this little spot fire that popped up in the month of September? Yes, well, it was an annoying spot fire. I mean, the irony of it, of course, is that in order to avoid uh, this issue being a distraction, the Labor government made it a distraction. Uh, and that is that the Obviously, the Prime Minister and somebody in the Prime Minister's office said, well, let's avoid this landmine. Um, but by interfering in the way they did, they just drew attention to it. Um, and I, I remember one of the senators from the National Party, when asked about the questions, she said, it's just data. Like, let's collect the data. Um, no matter how political you want to make you know, the LGBTI plus community in Australia, you know, let, let's get some data on who they are, how many there are, blah, blah, blah. It's you know, No matter where you are on the political spectrum, data is data. Yeah. Um, so after hearing this wisdom from the National Party, I thought, well, right. Um, I mean, obviously the census question doesn't is not accompanied by some kind of, you know, woke or indeed anti-woke messaging. It's a question. In yep. search of data, so um, it, so the virtues of the question itself, yeah, you know, the question obviously needs to be succinct and effective, and um, it be designed appropriately. And and there might be some questions around that. I don't know, but the government really did tie itself up in knots around this, and I guess that goes to two points, doesn't it? The first point is um, alert to distractions. They made this a distraction. So that's just ham fisted. Uh, and secondly, it shows that um, you know the government is um, like centre left governments um, and part political parties all around the world is kind of now f filled with this toxic anxiety about woke issues and the effect they have on the political conversation, how they mobilise the right, strengthen the right, and how can they be avoided? Um, how can the left sort of avoid these sort of cultural battlefields. Um, well, I mean, perhaps they need to do that, perhaps they need to engage in them, but certainly this is not a recipe for success. I'd heard that, you know, that the concern was how would this play out in Queensland? And I just thought, oh, really? Like there's not LGGP class Q people in Queensland? Like is it just a, a state just full of rednecks? No, it's not. Like. Where is a whole bunch well, of do you remember when Bob Catter said there are no there are no homosexuals in my electorate, <laughs> and it turned out his brother was one. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, yes, it's ridiculous, um, and data is data. Like the question is of itself doing nothing more than giving uh, us information about Australians. Yeah, and they were kind of doing it and looking and, at, and, at the Tories. Let's remember, and let's always thing. remember that the LGBTI plus community is not a monolith. Yeah. Its self-appointed spokespeople do not necessarily speak for it. Each of those letters does not work in close alliance. Sometimes they have different views, different opinions. They, they are as unanimous and monolithic as the rest of Australia. Yeah. Um, and... Sorry, uh, you know, a storm in a teacup. Uh, yeah, but I mean, the thing about it is, is that even just talking to you know my friends within that community, they want to be recognised. You know, they want to be acknowledged. They want to be seen. Like the marriage equality survey was a you know an important moment in their journey in Australian society. And now we're going back to 
Yeah, we don't want to see you anymore. We're not going to ask if you exist. Like far out. Just think it through from a from a from a values frame, let alone electoral politics. Just a bonehead move. Anyway, it got turned around, and that's good. So I'm glad to see the government came to their senses on that one. But it did cost us a couple of days. It, it did again. Let's. Uh, there's been a whole bunch of polls come out, David, in the last uh, it's at the tail end here of September. Um, and I'll just run through some of them, and I want to ask you about those, and then also just think about because I, uh, I was up in um, Sydney for work oh, last week, and just sort of talk, talking to some good friends of ours about when, when do we think the election's going to be, um, and uh, I think it was Josh Frydenberg that once said to uh, someone that I know high up in government who asked them, Josh, when are you going to call the election? And he said, we'll call it when we're ahead. <laughs> and uh, I just want to get your thoughts on what we're seeing from the data here, speaking of data. So essential Roy Morgan News Poll, YouGov and Freshwater all put out polls that were samples or surveys that were conducted basically between the 18th and the, well, between the 13th and 22nd of September. Uh, and I'll give you the two-party first. No, actually, I'll give you the primaries first. The essential primary for Labor, 29, LNP, 35. Roy Morgan, 32 for Labor, 37 and a half for the LNP. News poll, 31 for Labor. It's down a point from the previous one. 38 primary for the LNP. YouGov, 30% primary for Labor. 39% for the LNP. And Freshwater, 30%. Primary for Labor, forty-two percent for the LNP, uh, and the Labor two-party preferred across all of those. Essential is the worst at forty-seven, uh, but they have undecideds. Uh, Roy Morgan fifty point five, News Poll fifty, YouGov fifty, Freshwater forty-eight. So. Uh, nothing really has changed much, really. If you look at the trends of all of those polling companies, research companies, since they last did a poll, and in fact, I went back and looked at all of the news polls as far back as the middle of the year, our primary really hasn't moved. It's sort of sat around 31, 32, and our primary, sorry, our two-party preferred sense has been bang on 50, 50-50. So just if we were to take, first of all, what are your reflections on that, uh, on, those, on, those, on those surveys? David. Well, I think overall, as a Labor Party partisan, they make for depressing reading. And I think they go to the fact that, as we've said now for quite some time, the federal government just has no momentum. And we talked about how coming out of the voice, um, the Labor Party needed to sort of refind its federal purpose and refund momentum. It, it had a strategy for doing that. I mean, it seems from the outside, and, and a big part of that strategy was the reworking of tax cuts, um, which was uh, an ambitious and, uh, in my view, um, intelligent um, and astute move. But its impact was greatly dampened by the switch of so many to the war in Gaza and the obsession with that. And, that, and then I guess we've seen over the course of this year how, yeah, again, when those tax cuts were to come into effect on the 1st of July, you know, that got again muted by Senator Payman's um, uh, betrayal of Labor. Um, and so at key junctures across this year, um, Labor has sort of missed or been thwarted in its attempts to try and regain the momentum. And here we are now uh, coming to the end of September and the sort of situation has not greatly changed over the last 10 months. We, we don't have the policy initiative in, in, in the debate, in the, in the national debate. And the polls reflect the fact that this is a government that is for far too many, apparently one without purpose. And we've talked also on this show about how you know, the, the, the hostility between Labor and the Greens is intensifying, and that 
is you see that in the Senate, you see that in the housing debate, you see that um, in how the two sides spend so much time quarrelling with one another. Yeah. And while that's easy work for the Greens because all they want to do is quarrel with the Labor Party, they understand their mission with a laser focus, which is why all of their criticism is always directed at Labor, irrespective of who's in government, because switching Labor voters to Green voters is their raison d'etre. Our task always more difficult, more complicated. And so the more we debate with the Greens, the more we risk wasting time in our task of gaining momentum. And so here we are, um, potentially something in the order of six months out from an election, and it's a dead heat. Um, and, the, and, it, and it might be worse than a dead heat if our primary vote is 30% or 32%. Now, the Liberals, given their predicament, would probably like to have a primary vote of 41%. But if you're sitting inside Dutton's campaign team, these numbers are probably looking pretty hopeful. Um, they can imagine these numbers on the one hand, meaning that uh, they can take it up to the teals in a couple of key fights and also take it up to us, uh, the Labor Party, in key marginals. And when you sort of telescope ahead, you can see a scenario where an election in kind of March of 2025 is taking place <clears throat> um, at a moment when uh, Victorian voters are unhappy with the Jacinta Allen government but have not yet been to the polls and so get to take out that angst on a federal Labor government in a way that's a little akin to what happened in 1990 in Victoria with the Kane and Keating governments uh, when Labor lost nine federal seats in Victoria. I don't imagine it's going to be as catastrophic as that, but that's the kind of scenario. Mm. And at the same time in Queensland, there's been a change of government, but the coalition government is still young enough and new enough to be in its honeymoon. So it's kind of the worst of all worlds in terms of how state politics in Victoria and Queensland could feed into a federal ballot. So all of that tells me, I guess, that... Um, We'd like Labor, um, as it comes to the end of its first term in government, um, to be in a much stronger place. It's interesting to observe the chatter about when the election will be held. And you just said before in your opening remarks around March. Um, and uh, yeah, a, lot my, other, my, my, a lot of other folks have reason... involved. But... Here's an interesting thing. It doesn't have to be called, it has to be called on or before the 27th of September 2025. We're actually 12 months out from when an election can be held. Why would you go earlier if you're behind or level in the polls? Why wouldn't you say and go, we've got exactly 12 months to turn this ship around and make an argument to the electorate about why you need to re-elect us? Why would you go early? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I've said before on this program, the old adage, you call an election when you can win it. Um, and uh, you, you don't volunteer for execution early if you're going to lose, and hope springs eternal. Governments always press on in the hope that just around the corner lies salvation, and we've watched governments that are behind hang on to the bitter end um, for just that reason. Um, you don't want to see the Senate go out of kilter. Um, I, I guess the reason I'm picking on March is uh, it's often regarded as being a good season for elections uh, and it might be a moment when there's just been a bit of interest rate relief um, and these sticky interest rates uh, are starting to loosen up and there might have by it might be fresh on the back of a, a decent decision by the Reserve Bank but that's wild speculation on my part obviously I'm hmm. not an economist um, I'm barely a political commentator, but that's my hunch. Yeah. If you don't get that interest rate cut in March, then what do you do, David? Yeah, well, then I, I, I well, if the numbers haven't shifted, then you press on because calling a federal election as a first term Labor government um, on the basis that you've got a 50 50 chance is probably not good enough. And then obviously the next marker is the budget, which is in May. Do you deliver that budget? 
uh, well, the budget is an obvious moment when you would have a renewed effort to gain some momentum and take control of the political narrative. I hope we accomplish that mission well before then. Mm -hmm. The other question is, Labor has a uh, two-seat majority, 78 seats in the House of Representatives, 76 to form government. The Liberal Party have 55 seats in the lower house. They need 21 seats to form government. It's actually quite a big mountain to climb for them. However, Def having said that, definitely. you talk to all the different folks, all of our comrades from all the different states, and we're all looking at each other going, where are we going to win more seats? And everyone looks at Victoria going, surely you're worth two or three more. And we're like, dude, we're tapped out. Like, we give it a lot. And obviously the answer is, and we look at WA going, fellas, you had a great campaign last time. Can you hold on to those? I actually think they can. Um, I, I believe in incumbency in sophomore swings. New South Wales, our comrades there are saying, no, we're good. No more coming out of our neck of the woods. We're worried about Tasmania. We, there's rumours we might lose one there. Worried about um, the Northern Territory may lose one there. So there's two seats we've just lost, given that we're saying that WA hold and that we have to hold in uh, in Victoria and in New South Wales. So that means all eyes look at Queensland and go, team, it's up to you. There's a lot of seats yeah, well, it's, been, there. it's been up to Queensland for 15 years and they're, there's no reason to think their record's going to change, is there? I mean, mm. um, I guess I'd say two things about that. I, I, your optimism in WA is reassuring. I, th I think some pastoral care in the Northern Territory and Tasmania is in order. Um, uh, the, I think you know, Victoria is at a high watermark and so inevitably there are going to be co some contests in Victoria that should cause us angst. I mean, Higgins, mm. for instance, the loss of Higgins, um, hard to see how that seat's going to be replaced, uh, you know, given the Victorian share of the federal parliament is diminished by one and that one seat is ours. Um, you know, so let's imagine best case scenario for Labor is Victoria stays the same. Uh, then, as you say, all eyes turn to Queensland. Well, there's no reason for optimism in Queensland, is there? I have... Uh, I guess everybody I talk to suggests that um, standing still is our best case scenario. The Greens are, you know, uh, on the march, and um, how could we threaten them in Brisbane, Ryan, and Griffith? Um, so, yeah, I, I I don't see Queensland being. I mean, our result there is just so beyond miserable. Um, what is it? It's four of twenty nine seats. Um, but how's that going to get better? Yeah. But also then, where are the coalition going to find their 21 from? I mean, Dutton is saying that there are natural teal seats where there are what he would regard, I don't know who told me this, but apparently Dutton thinks that where there is teal members of parliament that he regards as basically quasi-Labor people, so Daniel in Goldstein is one of them, um, as opposed to where there are teal independents that actually look and talk like a Tory. He also thinks Monique Ryan falls into that quasi-Labor, which is hysterical. Um, he thinks that where there's a quasi-Labor teal independent, they'll win that back. Where there is a quasi-Liberal teal independent, they won't win that back. And so that's where they think they can make inroads on the teal. So I want to get your thoughts on that. I mean, Zoe Daniel, okay, yes, former ABC journalist, you could say that she has certainly more centrist type values, but money right the Tory. Yeah, well, that also, I mean, I don't, I, I have no reason to think that um, uh, Peter Dutton's analysis would be quite so crude. Um, I, I, I mean, I think Zoe Daniels' chances of winning are greatly improved by the fact that she's running against the same adversary. Mm. Um, and the Liberal Party, I think, made a bad decision there in in not switching to a new fresh candidate who could give it a fresh run because, you know, for better or for worse, fairly or unfairly, the previous candidate has baggage. Yeah. Um, and candidates you know, need to look at themselves, you know, 
honestly in the eye and they need party organisations to look at them honestly in the eye and say, okay, you know, the best thing for the movement is to get someone fresh. The Liberal Party should have done that in Goldstein. The fact that they haven't um, is the best thing going for Zoe Daniel because for her now it's just a rerun of the last election. And to quote um, uh, Kroger, you know, you can beat an opponent twice. Um, you can, you know, beat them once and then remind everybody how miserable their record was and beat them again. Yeah. Um, and the Liberals are giving Zoe that chance in Goldstein. There was a bit of Liberal optimism around Kuyong because of the redistribution, which I thought was misplaced. Um, they thought a whole lot of new Conservative voters had moved to the electorate, but a whole lot of voters moved to the electorate who were the same as the voters already there. Yeah. Um, so so I, there was no transformative offence. Um, I, I, I mean, I think some Teals are inevitably going to be under threat because Teals were elected into Parliament essentially on three drivers. One was Scott Morrison was Prime Minister. The second was um, a sense that women had been treated abysmally by that government and by the Parliament and the structures of power. And the third was inaction on climate change. And those three things fueled the Teal phenomena. And those three things are gone, either entirely or in large part. Um, Scott Morrison is obviously gone. Um, the sort of atrocious behaviour around women in the parliament and in politics has certainly uh, abated since the sort of horrific days of um, the Scott Morrison government and Brittany and all of the things that went on. Um, and there is, I hope, a sense that the government is now taking climate change seriously in a way the Morrison government never did. So the question for the Teals is how do they survive and thrive in an environment where the things that elected them have vanished? And they have, and of course the Liberal Party waits in the wings for all of it, the Teal voters to return into its arms as the anger about those things abates. Mm. And so we're really talking about, you know, what is the half-life of a Teal voter? Um, and I think it'll be really interesting to see how many of those seats just go home and fall back to the Liberal Party because those drivers are gone and they're not motivated to betray their traditional allegiance. Their voters are not going to betray their traditional political allegiance in the same way they're prepared to do at the last election. I don't know. I mean, what we saw in Indi, for instance, is that that became a lasting phenomena, didn't it? And mm. and, and that independent, independence there have been elected and re-elected and indeed transitioned to a new candidate and still been elected and re-elected. But I don't sense at this point the Tills are in the same level of uh, sort of zest and professionalism we saw with the independence in Indi. So... I am suspicious that the Tills will lose some seats. And I don't think it'll be because of any, did they look more liberal or did they look too Labor? That's a nuance lost on me and probably the electors. I think it'll be more about how do the Tills survive when in the absence of those drivers. And are they going to be bankrolled again by Climate 10,000 or whatever they'll call it? Well, I'm sure they will be, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But there was just a moment in politics there where they really did put a lot of money behind those campaigns because of the, the three things you outlined before. They're not there anymore. Does their funders, are they just as motivated now as they were four years ago, three years ago? Yeah, they, I'm sure they are. But, you know, they, they, I mean, that's the absurdity, isn't it? You know, you've got the, the, the progressive media was wrestling with this idea of, you know, there are good billionaires and bad billionaires and we want the good billionaires to fund our candidates we want the bad billionaires to be driven out of the system and how do we organize that well we will obviously continue to talk more about this as we get closer and closer to a uh, september 2005 uh to the 2025 election election date um <laughs> let's uh hint hint uh team in canberra um we've got a bunch of questions david from our loyal listenership and i'm gonna awesome move awesome. through some of them now um the first one's from john john i thank you so much for writing in uh he uh john asks uh 
what does it mean to engage young people in politics and organising if we're banning them from social media? And what does it mean for Labor and their need to reach the youth vote, which is a happy hunting ground for the Greens? Obviously, Jono's uh, question is in relation to this social media ban for children, um, which I am not completely across, to be honest with you. But, David, you've got children. Uh, I have. And, 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 you, and you know, because it's a contemporary issue, gonna, Stephen, I'm across it. Are you going to ban them from social media? What happened to the days when your parents said, go outside on your BMX and come home when the lights come off? Or go on, I should say, rather. <laughs> it might have been the other way around with you. but um, uh, Yeah, so I guess by way of background, it's useful to remember that the South Australian Premier Melanouskis um, it sort of flew this kite very successfully some time ago about being concerned about the impact of social media, banned uh, iPhones and smartphones from public schools in South Australia and mooted this kind of ban. And Federal Labor, for once in its life, recognising a good idea when it saw it, has taken this idea on. Um, and I think it is a good idea for, you know, as Paul Keating used to say, good policy is good politics. Um, and this is good policy, and it's seen as such, and that's what makes it good politics. Because, yes, parents, including my good self, um, do worry about um, what social media is doing um, to our young. Um, and it's not simply about what they may or may not see. It's also about how do they connect, how do they see the world, um, you know, are they living their life as an avatar or are they understanding the difference between reality um, and imagination? And um, I think it's critical that we let kids be kids and we let uh, and, and we make sure that we protect them uh, from devices and systems which are, you know, deleterious to them. I mean, we are conducting at the moment a global experiment on our young to see, you know, what does social media do? Because we don't know. I mean, it's the equivalent of giving them all a packet of cigarettes a day and trying to work out what effect it has. So, this giant experiment with an unknown destination about how um, our young can reorganise and, re and, and, and see the world. And, and, of course, what makes this experiment even more dangerous is it's being conducted and supervised by a generation who never had social media growing up themselves. Um, and, you know, in my case, I didn't see a computer until I was in year 11 or 12. So, yeah, and suddenly you know, I've got my, my son running around with, um, you know, technology that I, at the age of 10 that I couldn't have imagined. Um, so I, I think it is reasonable um, when we see the effect that social media is having um, to push pause. Um, and I think that is popular with parents. Now, what does it mean for political organisation? Well, it obviously means political organisation has to adapt, and uh, and so it should. But um, there's no point keeping a medium alive because it helps us reach voters if it's simultaneously having a you know, diabolical impact on our society. It's funny because I think about it in terms of the last time there was a medium that was so transformative, it was the television. And we all remember when we were growing up as kids and the rules that our parents had about the TV. You know, I can often, I'll be sitting there on a Saturday morning watching TV hits or rage or whatever. And this is when I'm a teenager. Eventually, dad would come in and go, right, TV off, you outside. And I guess it's what parents are trying to do right now with social media, isn't it? There is, they're trying to create boundaries upon which they can use this platform, but yeah. not to the excesses. I remember when we got our first colour TV. I remember, I don't know if you remember, uh, my family always had uh, a remote control, which was my parents screaming at me to get up and turn the channel. <laughs> yeah, ours was a shoe. <laughs> well, that's much more considerate for you. I just had to go and change the channel as directed. Um, yeah, a different era. I'll tell you a story, actually. Uh, my... Late father, mate, God rest his soul. On Sundays, mum would go to um, up to all the aunties in Maui uh, for her sort of Sunday sort of ladies who have cups of tea and smoke and talk about whatever. Uh, and dad would control the television. 
for the whole day. And it used to give me the absolute shits. I hated it. <laughs> I hated it so much because he would sit and watch friggin', you know, Sunday arts or whatever the ABC was showing. Uh, and my sister bought the exact same TV. And one day I went around to her house and I said, can I borrow your remote control? She said, what do you want it for? I said, I'll be back later this afternoon, but I just want the remote control. <laughs> so I went home and there's dad sitting there, you know, with his beer in the paper and was watching the TV. And I said, dad, change the channel, put it on something else. And he said, no, I thought we should do it. And then so I had my remote control and I flicked it over to a different channel and he's going, oh, what happened there? And then he puts it back to the station he was watching. And then I flick it back to the channel that I wanted to watch. What the hell? This thing's on the blank. And he just, oh, I did this for like 40 minutes, driving him absolutely insane. And eventually he gave up and cracked the shits and turned the TV off. Anyway, I felt bad. I never told him that. <laughs> I'm I never glad told him. That, I'm glad that these confessions can come out now. <laughs> um, it's going to be okay, Stephen. Uh, it's pretty funny. Mm, anyway. Uh, so thank you much, John, for that question. Uh, the, second question <laughs> <laughs> the second question is from Adrian. Adrian, thank you so much for listening to the show. And thank you also for writing me a question. Adrian's question, David, is with Labor's ongoing efforts to secure support for workplace reform, what strategies should the party adopt to counter the rising influence of independent candidates in traditionally safe Labor seats? We've obviously talked about the Teals and what they've done in Tory seats, but this is obviously a threat that we need to be mindful of as well. Uh, do you think that the party's doing enough to address local issues or are we risking further fragmentation of our voter base by underestimating grassroots movements? Mm, well, I really see that as a two-pronged question. So let me take the first prong, which is, um, as I interpreted it, um, so industrial relations reform and federal labour. Um, federal labour has made some important um, moves on industrial relations reform and um, it's been very interesting watching how that's panned out because they are sort of reforms that are entirely um, to be expected of a Labor government and the kinds of things that the Labor government um, working in partnership with the Australian Council of Trade Unions would advance um, to improve wages and conditions for um, employees across the country. But the What's been interesting to me is it hasn't got much recognition across the centre-left um, for being the reforms that they are, but it's got plenty of recognition from um, the business community who have sort of mobilised. <clears throat> and we see in the Murdoch press pretty consistently now a business beating a drum against the federal Labor government. And... You know, while that's to some extent to be expected, you know, Labor is at its most successful when it's got some or even most of the business community recognising the fact that, you know, it's large and in charge and is doing reform in the in the national interest. And 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 that hasn't happened. So that's that's alarming and annoying. Um, and on the other hand, my concern is that the sort of centre-left media are so disinterested now in issues of sort of economic justice and so preoccupied with issues of identity politics that old-fashioned IR reform just doesn't float their boat anymore. So some important labour gains there, and I think we need some fresh thinking about how we can promote them um, for the thing for the you know for the good good work that they are. Um, as for independents turning up inside Labor seats and this question of rank-and-file politics, yeah, well, I mean, I think that's an eternal challenge. Uh, being a little bit Victorian-centric for a moment, you know, we observed at the last state election that Labor held a lot of seats in its north and west, irrespective of big swings. And we've talked before on this program about how Labor needs to be alert to how those communities in particular are we, we, we talked about how COVID damaged them. We can probably talk also about how interest rates are damaging them. Um, and, a, and we need to make sure that the siren song of populists and um, independent populists doesn't drag them away from Labor and that Labor is still talking to them and organising effectively amongst them. So I certainly think that's a challenge. You know, the first rule is consolidate. The second rule is expand. And 
before you try rule two, you've got to make sure you've got rule one in order. So we have to consolidate our support in those seats. It is interesting, uh, those reflections that you just shared there, because uh, I was in the United States for uh, work uh, the other week, and we had a couple of meetings with some policy think tanks, progressive centre-left policy think tanks. Um, and one of the sessions was on how can the Democratic Party re-engage or engage with the working class, basically, or blue-collar workers. Uh, and you and I have spoken about this on the podcast, and I basically shared your opinions on why the Labor Party in Australia are far more successful electorally um, because of our, our unique relationship with the trade union movement. And I sort of put to them, I gave them the example. It protects of the Labor Party from its rank and file. <laughs> yeah. But there's, there's this, you know, the 50% of our, you know, the decision-making body of our party is made up of trade union, trade union members and trade unions. And I kind of gave them some context to that and said to them, I said, look, you know, for all of the great things that the Democratic Party does in the United States, and you are a big tent party and that should be admired, you do treat uh, a one particular community, the, the labor, well, they call it labor over there, the, the trade union movement as a, just another stakeholder. And so you're running around scratching and looking for ways in which you can re-engage with the working class base in states like Michigan and Pennsylvania and, and Wisconsin, uh, or, you know, everywhere really. Um, uh, you're, you know, you're running around looking for ideas, yet you treat the peak body that represents over 9 million of them like any other stakeholder. Um, and that kind of broke their brains a little bit because they were then wanting to go to the point where well, I don't think we can change our party rules to, you know, make them, you know, blah, blah. I said, I'm not talking about that. I'm not saying you need to make 50% of the DNC made up of trade unions. I'm just saying there's a Labor, <laughs> National Labor, there's a National Labor Reform Bill right now that seeks to reform the labour standards in the United States, it makes it easier for unions to organise, basically, um, that would push back on this right to work rule. And it can't get out of committee. It can't even get out of committee because you can't get the votes on the House of Representatives floor when you've had the numbers. Democrats won't vote for it. You know, and I guess that's the sense of how big your tent is. But Jesus Christ, <laughs> you weren't worried about trying to get, you know, working class people to vote for you. And you can't even get, change, create, you know, actual reform. Whereas here in Australia, we have and we consistently have. And Tony Burke, obviously, talking to you know leaders within the trade union movement, they've gone, Tony has been a great IR minister, to your point, that the conservative media are not pleased with Tony Burke uh, <laughs> in that portfolio. I'm probably glad he left, right? Former you know, SDA and uh, uh, organiser and industrial officer um, knows the trade union movement and has been a great IR minister for that base. I guess the question to, I put to you, Dave, is how do we translate that then into... You know, if the, if, the, if, the, if the strength that the Labor Party has is that we have this connection with the trade union movement, then that has to be transferred into votes on election day. And we have to, I think we have to lean on the trade union movement to say to their constituents in a very meaningful way, this is what's at stake in this election. And if you don't vote Labor, then all the reforms that we've got so far and the continuing reforms that we're going to be seeking from them to make your lives better in your workplaces um, are on the ballot. And you need to vote Labor. And I wonder, this is not a criticism of the union movement, this is a call to action, this is what I want to see at the next election campaign, which I think they're thinking about trying to do, but, I mean, just want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I'm sort of reminded of that old adage that all politics is downstream of culture. And I think what the trade union movement does for the Labor Party is it, as I've said before, keeps it anchored in working-class culture. It, it's all too easy to end up seeing politics as a contest between two different um, groups of aristocrats who themselves have not experienced the trials and tribulations of being working class. Um, and what the trade union movement does is it injects that and constantly re-injects that into the Labor Party. Mm. Now, you know, we could talk endlessly about how yeah, some unions are peopled and populated by officials who have less of that than we might like and yada, yada, yada. But the, I think the fundamental truism is still there, and that is that the net effect of trade unionism in the Australian Labor Party is to keep us 
anchored in planet Earth um, and to not drift off into some of the more esoteric uh, sort of identity politics debates that we have seen um, in, in the US in particular. Um, but it's, it's tough, right? I mean, we've seen, for instance, with this CFMEU thing and these large marches in Melbourne, um, very working class crowds gathering in anger against the Labor Party. Now, I'm not for a moment suggesting the Labor Party should resolve from its position. Uh, quite the contrary. But I, I'm, I'm, I would make the point that, you know, this stuff is hard and we, we need to, the Labor Party needs to constantly remain vigilant about the fact that it has got those Labor influences in its ranks. And, you know, the, as the Labor Party being an effective alliance between the progressive middle class and the organised working class, we need that cultural as well as political balance to remain um, you know, in the right place. And if one overwhelms the other, the Labor Party is the loser. Now, the Greens are obviously in the business of stripping us of our middle class progressive base by talking identity politics. And Dutton is kind of borrowing to the extent that he's able the American playbook and trying to rip off um, the sort of working class base around cultural politics. So you know, this is the vice that Labor confronts uh, and, uh, and confront it we must. One more contrast, actually, with the American experience. The other thing I took away from the trip was how united the Democrats are right now. And the Democrats are a huge tent. They are much bigger than ours. There are people that are in the Democratic Party that would not be the Australian Labor Party. And they are so locked in on Kamala right now. They're so united because they know that they have to be in the lead up to this election to win. We're going to to the, to the left or to the right or both. Both. Yeah. Both. It's remarkable, unbelievable. But we met with folks from both sides of the party, and they're not only united in trying to get Kamala elected, they're actually saying nice things about each other as well, and remarking about how good a team player they've been. It was. I walked out of some meetings going, "Fuck, that <laughs> is incredible." Because maybe That's we've right. been doing this. We've been doing this program now for four, you know, for four years or more than four years, but we've done four delegations. And I remember back in 2019, they weren't saying the same things about each other. Um, and now they are. And here we are walking into a federal election, you know, in the next 12 months, and we're not united. And that's well, remember the Greens uh, in Florida got enough votes to stop Al Gore becoming president of the United States. So... Uh, and that gave us George W. Bush, who gave us the Coalition of the Willing and Iraq and Afghanistan. These things change human history. Um, so good. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I think they're united by the sort of mutually assured destruction that a, the election of a Trump government and a Trump administration would mean. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, what frustrates me is that I think we'd be beating Trump, you know, six or seven to one if it wasn't for some of the baggage that the Democrats have given themselves uh, on some of these insane policies that they've been associated with over the last few years. Um, you know, the, 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 the orange man would be, should be, shouldn't be a starter after what happened on the 6th of January. Um, but here we are with the planet in the balance. No small thing. Uh, thank you very much um, to uh, Adrian for that question. Uh, let's go to Patrick. He's, this is our last question, and I think we'll uh, wrap it up. I haven't actually kept tra track of how long this episode is going for, but it feels Four hours, like... but it's been great. <laughs> <laughs> great. This question's from Patrick. Um, it, it's a doozy, so just um, bear with me for a moment, Dave. But just uh, <laughs> okay. He said, two mates and I are trying to predict the outcome of the next federal election. Uh, we're big fans of the Social Democratic and your election analysis episodes are a part of what inspired us to have a crack ourselves. We're trying, we're currently working from the 2021 census data uh, and we're mixing in a few forward predictions and more recent data were available. And we have a few theories we're trying to blend into a consistent model and he's going to list them out. The first theory is people under financial stress are more likely to vote against a sitting government. He said, we've boiled this down to 
single number for each electorate based on predicted mortgage repayments, rental rates, household incomes, and findings suggest that Labor seats are filling the pinch the most, particular Hall and Holt in Victoria. Second theory, news coverage will set the key voting issues and their sentiments affecting voting trends. Um, uh, we believe that in previous elections, the agenda has been set by, or at least the major news outlets, and they're trying to gauge um, and monitor um, political articles uh, across most of the outlets as possible, uh, analysing keywords uh, that are most prevalent in those articles and looking at a trend over time. These guys are doing a bit of work here. Uh, we've observed some interesting happenings from this data already, particularly with Peter Dutton successfully tying his name directly to the Israel-Palestine issue for a whole week. Uh, he says, I can't attach the photo here, but I've got a graph to prove it. Ha, ha, ha. Very good. And the last one is, uh, last theory is the fixed givens factor. This one um, is regarding primary vote. He said during the coverage of the last few election results, Joel Fitzgibbon has said something lines of, show me the results in Cessnock West booth and I'll tell you how it's going to play out. So the question is, um, with your experience of campaigning, David, what do you think about these theories? <laughs> uh, do you have any other suggestions of where to go next? There's a bunch of things in there to unpack. There are. Okay, so theory one, what was theory one? It was... Um, the uh, financial stress. People are Yeah, likely... okay, yep, 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 yep. So theory one, I think that's uh, simply a truism. Um, Yes, tick. Um, people will blame the government of the day for the financial stress they're under. Um, and inevitably, uh, people um, of less means will suffer more because they're spending a greater part of their disposable income on the essentials, and the essentials are becoming more expensive, leaving them poorer. So. Um, and, and, you know, you just have to watch, um, you know, well, I guess quantitative work. You just have to see people interviewed on the street who are not following politics closely. And if things have become more expensive in their lives, they will search for who is responsible. Uh, they will say, um, well, obviously this isn't the Labor government's fault because the Labor government has outsourced these decisions to the Reserve Bank of Australia and a complex infrastructure of advisory boards. No, in fact, they will blame the Labor government, um, notwithstanding its penchant for um, palming off responsibility. Um, and so, uh, yes, the, the government of the day is always in the under the gun for those sorts of things, and that's true across the world. Um, and Labor voters hurt more than others because uh, all too often Labor voters um, are spending a greater proportion of their disposable income on the essentials. And as they become expensive, more expensive, they get angry. The second one was the news coverage will set uh, the key voting issues. Yes, uh, it will, unfortunately, because as I have wailed and moaned and <laughs> ground my teeth, the fundamental fact remains that in between elections, politics is umpired by journalists and uh, they will umpire in a way that is biased, unfair, sometimes irrelevant to the electorate, but they'll do it nonetheless. And politicians typically are trained to jump to their cues. So, yes, uh, unfortunately, the mainstream media will dictate the pace. Uh, this is where winners and losers are. This is where David Patrick, this is where David and I disagree because I think that the good example of the last um, however many years of the Andrews government proved that that not to be the case because the Herald Sun and the Conservative media threw everything at them and we kept on winning and winning relentlessly and they didn't set the agenda. So um, we'll have to disagree on that one and we've had fights about that before and we don't need to relitigate that. I know, and but it's just because you continue to insist that provincial politics is the equivalent of federal politics and I could only entertain that for so long. I, mean, I had an argue, I had an argument with you this about this in the last episode. I just think that I know. There, there is a lack of strategic courage at a federal level. They should just tell the federal press gallery to go jump in the lake and ignore them. They're nuffies. They're all nuffies. Phil Curry still has a job, David, for God's sake. The guy 
Here's a dud. All right. The third one is the fifth given factor, and I'll boil it down to this. Show me the Cessnock West boot. Yes, yes. Um, listen, there are bellwether places, but they keep changing, don't they? And just when you think you've found a lasting bellwether, it's not a bellwether anymore. I'm old enough to remember when Eden Monaro was the bellwether seat for Australia, um, and it just isn't anymore. Um it, so the trick perhaps is not to follow the bellwether seat so much as to make sure you know which ones are the bellwether seats. Okay, very good, Patrick. Thank you very much for those questions. David, we're at time. Okay, well, it's been an honour and a privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time out of your lovely northern holiday to join us for this week's episode. A pleasure. Uh, we we wish you well on your travels with you and the family, and we look forward to talking to you in late October. Okay, well, let's hope that uh, we've got lots of good news to share in late October. Indeed. All right, mate. Cheers. Be well. Hey there. Thanks for listening to Social Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.